you everybody for uh, inviting me here to, to talk at the Non-Dilutive Funding Summit. So I love the title of this summit. This usually tries to be the punchline of our talks. To t you know, why would you want to take funding from ARPA-H? Well, it's non-dilutive and can really accelerate uh, the state of the art. And so I, I'm the newest kid on the block at NIH uh, with the omnibus uh, that landed on December 28th that established ARPA-H uh, squarely within NIH. Um, however, I report directly to Secretary Becerra, so we are an independent organization. Um, we are exempt from a lot of the policies of NIH, and I'll talk with you a little bit today about uh, what that means and then what our, what our vision for, for ARPA-H is. So our mission is to accelerate better health outcomes for everyone. Success for us is not a list of cell and science and nature papers. They are uh, technologies and capabilities that actually translate into the real world, um, and as our head of of commercial science, Craig Gravitz, who's here. So Craig, raise your hand. Jared, head of communications, raise your hand. These are folks you can also talk to, but success for us is when something actually survives in the wild and, and is actually used by a healthcare provider or a patient. So, so as mentioned, this was President Biden's vision. So in March of this year, ARPA-H was announced, and uh, I've only been in place since October, so it's been three months. Uh, still very early days. We're very much a startup, um, even down to the point everybody's like, when, when are you going to have solicitations? We're literally building the systems that we can actually start to receive proposals and build that team uh, that can start to review proposals um, as we go forward. And so. Our vision, if you think about DARPA was launched in response to Sputnik, this was a, it is urgency uh, around a capability that uh, the United States realized we did not have. Uh, there's not any one moment that ARPA-H was created for, but really this, this growing realization of this uh, frustration with the status quo and the urgency by which we need to bring new cures forward. And the promise of ARPA-H is, is our approach to how we do that. And we do that in a very different model from the rest of the federal government. Um, our starting budget now is two and a half billion dollars. It might sound like a lot, but that is in the context of 1.7 trillion dollars of HHS. And so reserved for us are very specifically high risk, high payoff um, projects to move forward. We do not uh, review anything by a committee. There's a, the sole decision maker is the program manager. And so we may take perspectives from our brothers and sisters at NIH and, and learn about what works, what doesn't work. But by having the program manager be the sole decision maker, we can take those big risks moving forward. And so the types of things that we want to seed and catalyze at ARPA-H and transition out of the agency are things like imagine if cell therapies could be built and assembled on demand for any disease target. We are disease agnostic as an organization. What if MRI could be delivered in the comfort of your home? More and more hospitals are closing, and so how do you bring some of these capabilities to the patient directly? And what if a personalized cancer vaccine costs a cup of a coffee? And so these are totally speculation. I am not going to dictate our technical strategy and the programs that we will manage. Um, it's going to be the program managers, so people with amazing backgrounds and CVs that want to come to ARPA-H that are incredibly passionate about solving a big program in health. And so those are the people that are going to dictate the programs that we work on. And so my, my ask of this community, first and foremost, because your question to me is like, how are you going to fund you? <laughs> the way we fund you is by identifying those program managers that want to come in and be a part of public service. And I'll tell you a little bit about the characteristics of a, of a great program manager who then can launch programs that you can apply to. And so a few key takeaways I think that are really timely to share are, um, I was very excited. One of the things, um, I've only been here for three short months, but I've already had 30 member uh, meetings with the Congress to really try to solidify um, the authorization for ARPA-H. And so the successes from that is um, an additional 1.5 billion, so we, we have two and a half billion moving forward. Um, establishing NIH, ARPA-H within NIH is important. We can lean on the infrastructure from day one. We could have a payroll, uh, but importantly, we report to the Secretary of Health and that we are exempt uh, from many of the policies of NIH. Uh, in terms of authorities, I, I only got leasing authority uh, on, on the 28th, and the Congress has required us to have offices in three geographic areas. And so we're in the process of identifying where will our headquarters be, where our satellite offices be. So more to come there. Um, but other things to, to really know about ARPA-H, so I've been appointed for a four-year term. Um, I'm a, a transient employee, just as our, our program managers will be. Uh, program managers are appointed for a three-year term, renewable for up to another three years. So this is a place we, we want to create a flywheel where we have program managers and new ideas constantly cycling through the organization. 
So uh, a place like the National Cancer Institute, 10 years ago studied cancer, today studies cancer, 10 years from now will be cancer. Um, ARPA-H will have an approach that's really portfolio-based. It'll be a diverse portfolio. And what we fund next year, if you come back five years from now, it's gonna look totally different because we're gonna be constantly cycling through those programs and program managers. Um, and we have an interesting uh, situation where there's a restriction on employment for individuals at ARPA-H. They cannot have um, worked at NIH within the last three years. And so this is really a, a nod for a, a different model. Um, we can get a waiver for that if we want to, but I, I do think this is a, kind of an interesting um, uh, authorization that the Congress has given us. So what is the ARPA model? I already mentioned to you that it's a program manager plus the, uh, the idea about a problem that they want to solve. Those two have to come together. When a PM walks in the door, they have three or four months to talk to the experts, what is the most audacious project uh, with achievable milestones that they want to pursue over the next three to five years. Um, if we're excited about that program, um, I will give them a bank account. We're anticipating those bank accounts will be between 50 and $150 million um, to solve a very specific problem in health, and then they will solicit the community for those solutions. And so um, any given program may fund, let's say, two to five teams, so divide that money across that bank account to try to get to that goal. And the people that are funded, of course, are, are called performers. But really important for the ARPA model, this isn't science for science's sake. This is really to support a critical path to a goal. And so any one team that might get funded under a program uh, that starts on day one may not be there on the last day of the program. So, so we're calling this, uh, our program managers are high performing athletes and this is a high contact sport <laughs> where they are really engaging with the performer community. If things are working well, we can double down and, and, and accelerate um, and advance the investment, bring FDA to the table to try to, um, to, to get regulatory approval etc. But if you're not performing, then we reserve the right to, to pivot and bring those resources back to ARPA-H and, and put them uh, to other parts um, of the program or, or new programs in the future. And so this is a really important point to know about our model. Um, and then for those projects that, that do succeed, uh, success to us looks like transition out of the agency. So you can start a program at ARPA-H without any pre-existing data. Um, we're willing to take a shot on goal to get to a proof of concept. Um, we're here to de-risk not only for the NIH and BARDA and other parts of the government, but for, for the venture community and others. So what, what needs to be de-risked before something could be commercialized and brought forward uh, to our customers, the American people? And so this flywheel, uh, every program manager will probably launch one program a year. So if they're here for three or four years, they'll have three or four programs. Um, and then they will eventually leave the agency as, as will their programs. And so this is, this is the design and how this is so different than the rest of what HHS does. Um, this is a DARPA business model. And so we are not here to replace anybody. We are really here as uh, an, an augmentation to the, the health ecosystem. And so we're a new player working with our customers, the public, patient groups, healthcare providers, and uh, working with performers, academic groups, small businesses, industry, and then serving, I think we can probably put a thousand <laughs> different stakeholders here, whether that's the federal government, um, other companies, NGOs, uh, that will be part of this ecosystem. And so the program life cycle, um, thinking about all of our transactions, I'd say 95% of our transaction will be, will be programs. We do have prize authority, so you may see some prize challenges coming out of ARPA-H. But the idea is you know, designing those programs around what we'll call an ARPA hard problem, so these really high risk, well-defined problems in health. Um, I'll go through the, the Howmeyer framework. This is just a series of questions that frames this, this problem in a way that is easily communicated to the public and to your colleagues um, at ARPA-H. Um, and then the stakeholder insights. So, so we've met with some uh, investors this week understanding you know, what are the macro trends in industry that we want to be looking for program managers to build towards. Um, but what are the other stakeholder insights? What about reimbursement? How are we thinking about regulatory approval? These things we have to think about on day one, not, not at the end of the program. And then that program manager you know, solicits solutions from the community, builds that performer team. Again, um, they are the sole decision maker, so they decide what the program is, and then when people apply, they decide who those performers are. They will help you shape your statements of work. It's a very cooperative project. They are not grants. Um, and then executing and measuring. So once a program is underway, making sure uh, you know, they'll be visiting you, they'll be traveling to see you, they want to see your progress and, and, and help you be successful. That is their goal, is for you to be successful. And then 
Um, as those programs uh, move further on, it's really demonstrating not evolutionary, but more revolutionary progress. You know, think 10x, 100x improvements to state of the art, and then trying to work and move forward to commercialize and transition and, and de-risk as we move forward. This can be everything from helping an uh, academic group bring on a management team and launch a company, um, or it can help with assisting with IP and licensing um, for the federal government. We don't want to own your IP. We're not going to dilute your capital. We really just want this to get out in, in the real world. And so some of our initial focus areas, these are just meant to be uh, demonstrations of really big levers of health, uh, not programs that will fund, but where we're seeking program managers to give us ideas for programs are what we're calling health science futures. And so this is a tools and platforms office where when we get asked what disease are you focused on, we actually say actually we're focused on tools and platforms that can benefit a broad swath of diseases. So think you know next mRNA technology or next uh, device uh, that can impact Alzheimer's, cancer, diabetes. Scalable solutions, so reaching everyone everywhere. This is not just scaled manufacturing, but also thinking about you know the American people in the most rural settings that don't have access to a good centralized healthcare. How do we deliver more and more capability to the home? Proactive health, this is you know, thinking about diagnostics, detection, early stage, keeping people in their, their healthiest state for as long as possible, preventing them from becoming patients in the first place. Um, we think there's a lot of really interesting social and behavior programs that might be part of this office where um, many diseases, of course, are preventable. And so, so how do we start to incentivize uh, people to start focusing more on their, their health um, using new, new technology and innovation? Those are all focused on, on really technology innovation, and we want to think about systems level innovation. Um, Resilient Systems is an office that's really a nod to taking some of the innovation that's already been catalyzed, that's out there, and then integrating it, maybe adding a data layer. Um, the, the last speaker mentioned RADx. So here's an example of a lot of investments in diagnostics, but what if we had a follow-on program that really integrated all of, all of those technologies into a single data layer that was useful at every single state in their different public health reporting um, and could give a, a dashboard to the CDC? What if we had that for the next pandemic or climate crisis? Um, these are the types of systems we're, we're looking for in that office. And then I just gave you a few notional examples, but others are, you know, what if we had a mammalian foundry? There's been incredible success on microbial foundries, but all bets are off when you start to get multi-chromosome and, and different cell types, and we don't have a way of creating those programmable cell therapies. Um, what about a common gene modulation tool that can be, you know, very simple um, and move forward to turn on and turn off uh, gene expression? Um, uh, there's some companies that are starting up in this area. This is an exciting place that we think um, further investment can really spur, spur synergy. Um, so these are just a few examples. Again, total speculation from my part until we, we have those, those program managers on board to run these, these programs. And so... What would be really helpful to me is, uh, again, just three months in, we have to build this technical team to be ready to launch these programs. And so I've been asking the community to think about one or two people in your network that might fit this description of somebody who's very passionate about solving a big problem in health. And so the position is time bound. It's a base of three years, renewable for up to six. Uh, competitive salaries, so with the authorities in the omnibus, I have direct hiring authority. If, for those of you that ever use USA Jobs, you do not have to use that system <laughs> to become a program manager. I can hire very quickly. Um, and uh, it's not a government scale salary, so I can hire um, up to the president's salary, which is uh, 400K a year. The PMs should be diverse in geography, demographics, and topic and background, so it doesn't matter if you haven't served in government. Um, because we're creating a team, I've hired 100 people since I've started, to, uh, to really execute and be the contracting officers, the legal team, people that understand what a fiscal year is. You don't have to learn that. We'll, we'll surround you with a team that's going to help you be successful there. Um, and then really, it, this is an opportunity to change the course of, of your field. And so that should be what really motivates these program managers to come forward. And so, you know, some of the other common traits are um, these folks aren't afraid to fail. In fact, uh, if they're not failing, it means that they're not taking big enough risks. And so we want to have folks that are comfortable, that, are, that can fail but move on very quickly from that, that are technically honest. If something's not working, you have to have the technical integrity to, to understand that and, and move on. Um, and these folks, they don't have to be biologists. They don't have to be experts in health. Um, they can come from any sector but are just really motivated to, to solve some of these challenges. 
Um, and they can be any, any stage in their career. So early stage, um, not jaded, which I would say I'm more of the next stage, <laughs> which is you know, status quo challenger. So not satisfied with the state of the art. And you know that if you, if you had a budget of $100 million to, to change the state of your field, that you'd be able to have a vision to do that. Um, and late stage folks are, are actually really great as well because they have a, a very clear idea. Maybe this is the last thing they do before they retire, but they have a clear idea of a big problem in health that they want to solve. So all of our programs are framed around the Heilmeyer questions. And for those of you that have ever worked with DARPA, uh, questions one through eight will sound familiar here. Um, very basic, what problem are you trying to solve? How is it done today? What's new in your approach? And why do you think this can be successful? What's happening in industry and technology that, that you think is ripe for advancement? Um, who cares? So who's, who is this going to matter to? And what, who in the real world is going to adopt your technology if this is actually successful? What are the risks? How long will it take? Uh, how much will it cost? And then how do you measure success along the way? What we've added for ARPA-H are, are two really important additional questions. So one is to ensure equitable access for all people. How will you, in the design of your experiment, address accessibility, cost, and user experience? And so we're bringing in experts that human-centered design, uh, folks that will, will help you uh, create a technology somebody actually wants to use and adopt. So this is going to be a really critical piece for us. And then finally, this is a little bit of a reflection of my time at DARPA. I was there um, when we launched some of the mRNA vaccine technologies. How might this program be misperceived or misused? There's an there's a, a infodemic now, as we all know, around misinformation. And so as a program manager, what can you do right up front to make sure that, that your new technology that might be able to have a major impact in the world is not being misunderstood? And so again, we do not have research grants. These are contracts and cooperative agreements, um, other transactional authorities, and we are going to measure success by how projects survive in the wild. What we mean by that is somebody's actually using them. They want to use these technologies. They want to adopt them. Um, they start to make things that might sound impossible, actually, uh, realization, and that we have measurable outcomes for health um, that are positive. And some of these things we might not be able to measure for 10 years from now, but we're going to make those initial investments uh, to, to try to get folks there. I do want to highlight um, Patio. This is uh, Craig Gravitz, who I pointed out is uh, the director of our Project Accelerator Transition Innovation Office. Um, it's a bit of a mouthful, but it's is, um, really providing those program managers um, right at the very beginning of program design. So helping with the market assessment. Is there a market pool in this, if you're successful, that somebody's wanna, gonna be a follow-on funder? How are you designing this so somebody wants to use this? And so this is really good support for a PM. So you can imagine if you come from academia or from government, you might not know how to do this, but Craig and his team are going to make sure that we, are, um, that we have the capability to support you in that. And he's creating some really interesting ways to work with venture capitalists and people that do this for a living uh, to help us understand what the market pool is, not, not government deciding what this is, but actually the private sector informing us. Um, helping you develop the, the BAA, um, doing you know, due diligence, VC style, which is, again, thinking about commercialization and survival in the wild, this is really important. Um, and then helping PMs and teams protect IP and, uh, and so on to move, move forward and get this into, into the wild. Just a quick status update. Um, I, I made this slide for Congress. They're like, you've been there for three months. What have you done? Uh, so, so we've launched a website. This is really how early stage we are. I encourage you, um, please go to the ARPA-H website and learn a little bit about um, being a program manager. The mission thrust areas I, I shared are all on that page. Send folks our way. It's a form fill to apply to be a program manager. Um, we launched at Howard University, so we know how much uh, a lot of universities, especially HBCUs, are underrepresented in funding um, at our type of organizations, and so we have to be very proactive in our outreach in engaging those communities. We want them to be part of this. Um, we uh, also have, I mentioned, engaged with Congress, and we're starting to really work closely with universities so they understand our mission um, and patient advocacy groups. So we want to hear from them, what are the problems that you need solved um, as we go forward? And so really, again, our, the call to action is um, think about your, your community and who might serve as a program manager. We've built the business team now to support them. Um, but if there's program managers that you're really, um, program areas you're passionate about, in order for us to fund those, we need that internal champion uh, who's a program manager. So with that, I'll pause and I'll, I'll take any, any questions uh, from the group. Thank you. Uh, thank you for what you're going to do. 
and I applaud your race managers. But if I'm an innovator or a disruptor, are you guys ready to take applications for your space zero project? I, we're not ready to take applications yet because we, we have nobody to review those applications. And so we really need that technical team to be on board. Um, and so until we have program managers, we're not in a position to be able to, to review um, and spend that money. And so that's why, that's, that's my forward message now is we, we need those PMs on board. Um, and, and timeline, I mean, it's not that, we, we, have a, we have a robust pipeline of PMs across a diverse area, uh, topic areas, and so we're expecting to announce the first tranche, um, first quarter of this year, and so then that they need three or four months to, you know, write the solicitations and, and announce those, so around summertime, um, you should start to see the first, the first announcements coming out of our page. I saw this question here. Uh, you mentioned cancer, diabetes, some of mm -hmm. the more common things that got in funds. What other uh, areas are you looking at? Does infectious disease come in now? Mm -hmm. You know, kind of close scope. Yeah. Wide open scope. So, so what's 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 nice about Arbor H is it's not a requirements based organization. Same as DARPA. So, so you know, Army, Navy, Air Force, they all have their military requirements. They they must do certain things. There's no must do for us. So even though we were announced in the same breath as Moonshot, and we're excited to work on cancer projects, there's no requirement for us to work on any specific topic. So we're we're, we're open to anything that you can link to health. Mm -hmm. uh, we you like DARPA have an omnibus PAA for. Are those technologies that might not? Mm -hmm. We anticipate that we'll have an open BAA, but but again, uh, we we will not launch that until we have the technical team to, to review it. But yeah, that, exactly with that model. So so that's like the catch-all for the other ideas that don't fit programs. That's right. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. <laughs> Piggyback on this question, if by summer you'll be ready to get going, what will be the timeline for the submission to for the site? Yeah, I mean, I, I think aspirationally, what, what DARPA was able to do on a regular basis was 90 days uh, turnaround, and so that, that would be our goal. Um, there's a lot of things that have to fall into place. So for us as a new, any new organization within the, the U.S. government, you kind of had training wheels on on your contracting the, the, the first year. There's a, there's a lot of additional layers that we have to go through for approvals so that we can prove to HHS that we are competent <laughs> and we're going to be able to do this on our own. And so, so the first year, I would imagine that maybe take a little bit longer because we need to convince everybody that we can do this on our own and we look forward in the next year or so to have um, a little bit more freedom and autonomy to do that on our own. Mm -hmm. uh, if a company has an innovative solution and they have IP around it, and, um, how does the government partner with that company, like if they want to fund accelerating it? We will, we will fund accelerating it. We don't want your IP. <laughs> we want you to own it. We want it, you to commercialize it. We want to be your um, customer one day. Do you have an estimate of what size the funding is looking for projects and how much of that would be on your private industry versus like university research? Mm -hmm. So um, it's up to the program manager to propose a budget. So, um, and we, we mentioned kind of the range of 50 to 150 million dollars because that's kind of the range that that DARPA biological technologies programs were. Um, but it's we we asked the program manager what's realistic for the problem that you need to solve. And so maybe we'll have programs as small as 20 million, maybe as big as 200 million. It's really dependent on the problem. And then uh, the program manager in their solicitation will say, you know, each team must do X, Y, Z completely open to industry, completely open to academia, so there's no set, you know, 20% have to be industry or whatever whatever that number is, I hope it's much higher. Um, but there, but commercialization and transition will must be a part of it. So um, I anticipate we'll have quite a bit of industry applications or partnering with academia, so maybe proof of concept in the academic lab and then a commercialization partner to bring that forward. And with, like DARPA, it's the contract, it's not a grant. That's right. So at any time the contract is stopped, that's right. And if there's a problem along the way or something, there's some of these things harder you're talking about than a moonshot kind of thing, you might run into some. So, so I think what's important to know is that every, I mean, I was, I was a program manager, and it's always hard to have that conversation when you have to cut funding, but that program manager started this program and selected you because they want you to be successful. And so they have every interest to help you be successful. They'll bring 
regulators to the table, they'll bring other partners to the table to try to help you be successful. But if there's a, a law of physics that can't be overcome or, or some other factor, um, they, they will have to pivot those funds, but it should never be a surprise because you should have a good man relationship with that program manager that it's, it, they know it's coming. But it, it, it's true, like that's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very different funding model in that way. But it doesn't mean a setback to kill the project, it just means a plan yeah, and it, when I was at Darby, we renegotiated timelines all the time. Like, you know, if, if you need two more months because there's this key hire, like, you know, these are conversations, totally fine. Um, but, but, you know, at, at some point, if there's no progress, then it'll have to end. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. I really applaud your efforts. Um, probably one of the most innovative uh, thought processes behind innovation. Uh, and surprisingly coming out of federal government, but really applaud your efforts. And, and there's a great book out there called Loon Shots, which, which talks about Safi, yep. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, this is all about, and I was very impressed with, with that story. Um, the most interesting element of this is that the headquarters and, and the locations are outside of NIH central thinking. Mm -hmm. what, what is the process or what's your thought on when those locations will be determined, how those locations will be determined, and uh, mm -hmm. sort of the criteria behind it. So I'm going to tell the Congress before I tell you. Um, so, so with the omnibus legislation, um, there's a 30-day alert period that we have to share with the Congress our criteria for how we're selecting those sites. So we're in the process of, of doing that, and so, so I, that would be a pretty public uh, process soon. Yep. Well, what, when, what is the timing for? They haven't given us timing, but but for me, it's it's ASAP. I mean, we, we have already, um, we, we, we a lot of our teamers actually have WeWork memberships. We're getting together and just like, you know, trying to, to crank through problems. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's uh, it, so it's urgent for us to, to start to get together. Um, I should say, we're not going to make our program managers move to wherever headquarters is going to be. When, when I was at DARPA, the best description I heard of DARPA was 100 program managers linked together by a travel agent. Because uh, you're, you're traveling all the time, you're visiting your performers, you're coming to JPM. Um, and so it really doesn't matter where you're located, but we, we will get folks together, um, you know, for, for home weeks and things like this to, to, to work on problems collaboratively. But if we're doing our job, we are, we are all over the United States all over the world doing our job. So it actually kind of doesn't matter where a boring office building where there's a couple of computers and like contracting officers is at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Hi. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, a lot of that is finding the program managers that are that are really passionate about like answering just that question. If you're working on Alzheimer's and and you're and you're tired of the status quo, what is the unique thing that ARPA-H can fund? To to I mean, there's a lot of funding in Alzheimer's. So so how do you carve out something that's really specific and novel that will advance the state of the art? And again, you know, transitioning out of the agency doesn't mean that it's already at scale <laughs> at that moment, but it's that there's a, there's a path and a trajectory, you know, you're working with regulators to, to, to get there. And I, I agree, you know, I, I, was, I was telling my team, it's not going to be, you know, 15, 20 years from now that I, I know if we were successful. What will be immediately clear is if, has we, have we created the culture and environment that allows for risk taking and innovation, allows for the creation of loon shots? Um, it, it, that should be obvious soon, but then we won't really know the, the payout for, for a longer period of time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there's obviously overlap with DARPA on other medical efforts as well. Is that by design or is it coordination? Or Definitely coordination. There should be no overlap in funding. Um, obviously, the Biological Technologies Office is is limited by the projects they can work on because of the big D in front of DARPA for defense. And so, when I was at DARPA, one of the reasons I was like so excited to come to ARPA H because of the number of program uh, ideas I had to turn down when I was at DARPA that that you know around pediatric cancer and things like that. You just can't spin it to be defense, right? Um, and so, I think there's a lot of energy in the community, but um, you know we have a lot of uh, you know ARPA community is small, um, so so we are engaging. Quite 
quite a bit with DARPA to make sure that we are, we are um, if there's a program manager that comes to me that's more appropriate for DARPA that we're sharing, vice versa. Um, we're, as we move forward and we'll select programs, we'll make sure that we're, we're deconflicting with them. Um, it's also important for our team who maybe have never worked at DARPA to, um, to be closely engaged to that community and understand you know, what works, what doesn't work. But again, we're, we're not copy pasting that model. We're, we're doing some things differently, right? It's, it's, it's learning perspective um, and moving beyond that. Am I, is my time up? No, definitely not. Okay. Question coming from our online viewers. Oh, sure. Just wondering, we're just wondering about, you know, non-U.S. companies and how, you know, they could apply as well and their funding. Absolutely. So, I mean, all, all the same government, like ITAR restrictions will, will apply, but, but um, I mean, DARPA can also fund uh, non-U.S. companies. So um, that'll absolutely be in scope for us. Question over here. Mr. Ross Young, my consortium. How do you ensure that a company that has a breakthrough technology that's never been taught in academia or practiced in industry in any way will get the vetting needed when nobody knows anything about it? Yeah, so I, I mean, this is why we are trying to do as much outreach as possible to let people know that we exist. So at, at DARPA, we had the pleasure of existing for 60 years. People just know DARPA and come to DARPA because it's, it's a known quantity. I don't think I fully appreciated until I've been in this role how, how few people in the health sector know what DARPA is and therefore definitely don't know what ARPA H is. So, so we need to get word out that we exist, but then it's, it's uh, you know, once folks know that we exist, it's just reaching out to us, right? I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a simple form fill on our website. Uh, it's not a BAA, we're not funding through it yet, but like inquiries and ideas, you can submit those now. And so, um, and then it's just finding that person internally to, to connect with. What's the mechanism for a review of a proposal? There is not a mechanism open yet, but there's, uh, if you go to our website, there's a landing uh, site. So oh, the, the slide is gone. It's, it's inquiries at arpah.gov. So you'll, you'll connect with the person and, uh, and, and be able to have a chat about the work. But again, it, it, we don't have that technical review process yet because we don't have the staff there yet. No, no, no. Cancer Moonshot is a, is a huge consortium of probably 50 or 60 organizations that's run out of OSTP by, by Danielle uh, Carnival. Um, but we are, we are now a member of that, of that consortium. And so uh, I, I have a close relationship with uh, Monica Bertinoli. She's the new NCI director. She started just a week before I did. And so we've been having great conversations around, I want to understand what are her big problems in health that NCI is not going to tackle. And so one really great example is like digital histopathology. So, you know, three-dimensional characterization of a tumor where you have multi-channel histopathology data. We've made great strides in kind of AI automated reading of, of radiograms, but now like the multi-channel and three dimensions of, of, of histopathology um, is, is nowhere there yet. So investment from ARPA-H to move the needle on digital histopathology will not only benefit cancer, but Alzheimer's disease and, and, and other ailments. And so we're trying to think about what are those platform innovations that we could do at ARPA-H that will advance the state of the art for, for cancer moonshot. Mm -hmm. So, a brief presentation of the very ambitious uh, project. Some of these high risk, high reward programs by definition were you know, touch ups of policy, mm -hmm. gnarly policy issues, right? So, such as people lost to the healthcare system, <coughs> and people that have been part of the healthcare system. Uh, system. Would, would ARPA H be an organization to facilitate those discussions? Yeah, so, so we are not a policy organization. We are a science and innovation organization, but it doesn't mean that we'll be, um, you know, external to all policy conversations. And so one of what I've learned when I was at DARPA was one of the most impactful things that we can do um, is with our programs have some soft governance. So examples of that is, you know, require that clinical trials are diverse and that, that you have representation of the communities that you're trying to serve. We, we can put that in a BAA and just say, we're not gonna give you money if you don't do this, even if the policy doesn't exist, right? So that's, a, that's some soft governance, this as an example. But then what those programs do is then they create the data sets that we can bring to policymakers and say, look what we did. We had the soft governance that, that you know, said do X, Y, Z, and these are the successes that we have, and then it forces some of those policy to think about those, those problems, and they're very open to this, and, and this goes for FDA too, so they wanna be a part of our programs 
from the very beginning, FDA regulates uh, products, not technologies, but some of these technologies will be the first time they see it, and we don't want to surprise an FDA reviewer with something they have no idea about. And so having them be part of our program from the early days, they can start to get the reviewers on board to be ready uh, when, when the time comes to, to review that proposal. And, and I didn't mention this in the omnibus, but um, the Congress has given us um, actually a way that we can reimburse FDA for working with us and being a liaison, being embedded in our programs to help accelerate um, and, and move towards regulatory approval. So those are, those are a few examples of how we're planning to use those authorities. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for your enthusiasm for this. This is very exciting. Um, on the program manager condition that you're promoting mm -hmm. today, for folks that are in the industry or in academia, will they what restrictions would those Industry, yes. You have to leave, um, and there's an ethics review, so you may have to um, sell some of your stock or equity um, if, it, if it touches the health sector and the programs that you're going to work with, but that's a conversation that we have as, as part of that process. There's also blind trusts that can be set up. Um, on the academia side, yes, you can join as a government employee, but uh, some universities also offer what's called an IPA, or an Intergovernmental uh, Personnel Agreement, which is uh, going on loan for, for like three years to ARPA-H. And so that's, um, that's a very common mechanism that DARPA used, for example, so you don't lose tenure or you know, whatever it is that you're, you're able to go back into your institution. Mm -hmm. um, with respect to... Uh, private investment and, and sort of private investors um, mm -hmm. under the patio program, how would a, uh, a fund or an investor interact with our buddy? They would talk to Craig. Craig right there, <laughs> and, uh, and, and he's just been this like tremendous network builder um, with folks in the private investment community that really are excited about what we're doing and, and want to help contribute, and we have, we have many, many different ways that, that folks can do that. So, so Craig will be the best point of contact on that one. Yep. I have another question about that. Mm -hmm. Is not going to be a resource just for folks with funded projects, or is that something applicants could access as well? Um, what is that? It's for, for funded projects, and so and and in service of the program manager. So so Pat is really in service of the program manager and the programs. And so um, one example would be maybe before a program exists, working with a program manager to say like, what is the market pull here? Is there a market pull? Uh, we don't. Our market doesn't have to exist for us to start a program, but it's like that's really important to know <laughs> that that because that's going to be part of the, the program manager's job is to start to pave a way if a market doesn't exist yet. So, but not uh, per se for applicants. Yeah, I saw a question back here. Yep. Can you offer any more guidance on how the PMs might structure their programs? Uh, if they are three or four year ones, how many, how many groups would they bring in? What kind of grant size or contract size would they each end with you? It, it genuinely is up to the program manager. So it's, the, the burden is on them to, to decide what their program looks like. And so I had four programs at DARPA. I had um, one program that I had three teams that got about $30, $40 million each. I had other programs where I funded more like 10 teams for $5 million. And so it's really like, what is the problem that you're trying to solve? What's appropriate? Is there a clinical trial? Are you actually building hardware? The, the idea is to resource a project so that you have the capital expenses that are, you know, to, 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 to do the job. You have the team in place to do the job. And the only thing that's your blocker is the technology. And so, so that's the spirit of the funding there. So there's not any set award. They're building this. Yep. They're identifying what are the gaps that need to be addressed to solve this problem. And so, so for me, I, I had a gene modulator program and identified three areas of investment. One was around delivery. One was around um, actually determining kind of dosage. Um, and then the other was around just like what is the modulator, what kind of activators and repressors. And so those are the three investment areas that each team had to address. Um, and then the budget was, was spread around that. That's just one very specific example for that problem. For another program, it'll be totally different. Yep. So other than the, uh, the web stuff, is there a way to UK to our page at this point while you're still bringing on your program directors about areas that industry, say, perhaps considers to be things you might want to be looking at or, or identifying mm -hmm. or thinking in that space. 
I mean that that is that is the one portal now, but we're we're a small team, so you will you will reach us. We will listen. I mean, we want to hear what are those macro trends, and what's what's important is if we're not hearing about if we're hearing a lot that there's these macro trends that exist, and we don't have a program manager candidate, that's an opportunity for us to start to have a focused search for program managers in those in those areas. So so reach out through the website, the, or you can come to me. Come to Craig. Yep. Okay, yep. Do you see for the proposal process what you can kind of interact with the program managers to talk about an idea before it gets a lot of work with you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so um, the way there, there are some legal restrictions to that. So so the first is once um, once a program manager comes on board, I, I mentioned it's going to take three or four months for them to actually like launch a BAA. It's because during that three to four months, they are talking with the field. They're talking about experts, like understanding like what is the actual problem, what are the opportunities, what are the innovations they need to know about. That's completely free and open conversation. Um, once a BAA is released, then then the by law we're restricted because you can't give any one person or group an advantage over another proposer. Um, but program managers will hold proposer days, which are an opportunity to, to hear that program manager, give a talk like this, what's their vision for the program, um, and then you can have kind of quick one-on-ones that are more like, hey, here's a concept I'm developing. Is this in scope? Is this not in scope? And then uh, most program managers will do um, a, a short white paper before you know maybe four or five pages to so it's it's not a lot of time for our page it's not a lot of time for you so just do that quick assessment is there 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 and then if there is you'll be invited for a full proposal and I'll, and I'll say to the community if you're ever not invited like that really means something and like you should not apply <laughs> um, and that's that's actually, I think really important feedback um, because it's it's really just the when, when a program manager invites proposals let's say they'll invite 10 they can probably only afford five and so if you're not invited you're, you're not in that that group of 10 and so that's I think really important feedback for folks to know yep. thank you so much for this very informative when you do a clinical trial that's really innovative uh, how much do you liaison with the FDA? Because they usually want regulatory stuff, animal studies, and they, they have a process of making sure it's safe. So mm -hmm. they're out right from day one so even in scoping that program so in that first three or four months when we're developing the programs they have to be a stakeholder in that conversation and so all of my programs I had CBER like at my proposers day too so that not only could they ask me questions about my vision they could ask FDA and say okay you know we're thinking about this two preclinical pre trials would these qualify and what was really interesting one of my programs um, there was no it, it was a it was a gene editing technology and it was um, looking at off-target effects that didn't exist at FDA and so actually in response to the program FDA and NIST started a new program a pre-competitive program for industry to create the tools and gold standards to measure off-target effects for gene editing and so that's another way that um, you know there was a question about policy earlier that's how we can kind of influence changes in the system uh, to be ready for these technologies that are moving forward mm -hmm. two more questions all right you you haven't heard from me yet <laughs> Yeah, so again, we are not a requirements based organization, uh, but uh, I, I'm, I'm a big believer in the bioeconomy and we're really launching the, the century of, of biotechnology. And so, you know, having program managers in that space that are excited about cellular manufacturing, um, you know, addressing supply chain API issues, these are all in scope. Again, we, we need a program manager, but, but at, you know, we would love to contribute to those goals as well. Awesome. My, my question kind of follows up on what you just said. Mm -hmm. If you have a regular technology, again, that no one's ever tried, how do you put out a request for a proposal from five or ten organizations that have no experience in it? So, I mean, it, there's a vision, again, the program managers are not prescribing how to solve a problem. They're, they're stating a very well-defined problem in health, and they're soliciting from the community, what are your ideas to solve this problem? And so it's, it, they, will, they will not tell you how to do it. They're, they're genuinely looking for the community. How, to, how should we solve this? And then when they select the, the, the performers, it should be a diversity of approaches because it's so high risk. Some will work, some won't. Um, and so those are, the, those are the ways to sort of create those shots on goal. And again, the goal is to solve a problem. Yep. All right. Oh, one more. <laughs> this is actually more of a comment than a question. Okay. Uh, I love this as well. What you said, this is a great concept. Have you thought about leveraging like outgoing groups 
or White House fellows or digital services folks that are already, already been instructors and maybe aren't ready to go back to the industry might not want to get a job in other federal agencies mm -hmm. to be instructor. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we have, so you mentioned PIF, so Presidential Innovation Fellows. We have two right now on staff. Um, one of them helped uh, build our website, and we joked that only instruction was like, under no circumstance can it look like a government website. And so I think like mission accomplished, but uh, but that that's exactly why we want those folks. And so, so we're going to be uh, just... Yeah, very, very happy users of, the, of, those, of those programs. Um, and, and, you know, I think what's really unique is that we're starting a new government organization from scratch, and so we are not required to use, you know, you know there's, there's cybersecurity things, et cetera, but, like, I don't have to use the regular government system. So, so the rest of the workforce uses Slack and G Suite. Like, we can do that, too. We're not required to not do that. And so, so these are things that, are, like, are kind of boggling the minds of the people at HHS who are putting these proposals for <laughs> Like, you can do that. We're like, yeah, of course. And so, so but it's, it's because there's no system in front of us that is, like, forcing us uh, to, to do that. So that goes on the data side, too. Though. So the data piece is really important to us that we get that right, and we make sure that all of the data coming out of our programs is, like, machine-readable, and that we're bringing people that know a lot about AI assurance, and that we're, we're creating the quality of data that is going to be useful for the entire community. And so this is another, I didn't talk about today, but a big push is hiring that team that's going to be our data, our IT, our AI team uh, to support the rest of the organization. It's a good point. So if you know somebody in those domains, send them our way, for sure. <laughs> Yeah, well beyond the PM, there's lots of opportunity for innovation. Well, thank you very much.